Could you just talk a little bit more about what each of the companies do, what the main product is, how it works? Yeah, so I, I touched on that a little bit already, but uh, our product is really uh, this short-term installment product that's interest-free, which we think is a really important aspect of the product because our goal as a company is to attract what we call prime-to-be young consumers. And I always tell people that that was like, a, we're trying to attract the young me because when I was a young consumer, I thought I was prime, even though I was definitely subprime, but I knew that I wouldn't have paid a dime for, for credit. And so that's why our product is interest-free, to try to attract these young consumers into our product and give them purchasing power, which in turn gives them purchasing power with our merchant partners and leads to additional sales and conversion for them. So at, at Acorns, the, the problem statement that we're addressing is that 70% of Americans don't have $1,000 saved uh, for an emergency fund. Um, the, it's basically an epidemic in our, <laughs> in our society um, that people aren't saving and investing. And so what we're building and what we've built at Acorns is a financial wellness system that makes it really easy and simple for customers to start to save and invest in their financial future. So um, I don't know if there's any Acorns account holders or users here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but basically how it works is you download the app, you answer a few questions, we recommend an investment portfolio for you. Um, the portfolios are made up of a diver diversified set of ETFs. They were created with, in partnership with Nobel Prize winning economist, Dr. Harry Markowitz. So for $1 a month, the average person can start to get a hold of their financial future. You can set up a reoccurring investment, so $5 a week, uh, a day, a week, or, or a month. Um, and you can put a one-time contribution at any time. The feature we're best known for, you can link as many debit or credit cards. And every time you make a transaction, we take the spare change from that transaction and, and invest it into your Acorns account. So that's a dollar. For $2, you get a retirement account. And for $3, you get all of that too, plus um, our new debit card, our spend card, um, all digital banking, no overdraft charges, um, no ATM fees. So, so really just a look at, at getting a hold, helping people get a hold of their financial future. Yeah, so we, we at Chime are actually focused on a pretty similar mission as Acorns. Uh, we think that the way in which uh, banks have historically operated in the United States has really ignored the, the needs of average, everyday Americans. Uh, and so, you know, we define that as people who largely live paycheck to paycheck, but for America, that's, uh, that, that's higher and higher in income, as, as most of you have heard. And uh, people are often faced with situations where they just don't have uh, $300, $400 in their savings account and yet their bank also charges them $300 or $400 a year in fees, overdraft fees, monthly maintenance fees, low balance fees. Uh, and that's sort of the state of affairs that we're trying to solve and we've been really focused on solving. And so uh, we really do that by delivering financial peace of mind through our sort of mobile app experience and our debit card. And so yeah, we have totally no fees for our product. Um, we get people paid, in many cases, two days early, which is a huge boon for them in terms of solving some timing issues that they often have in terms of bills and rent at the end of the month. Uh, and we're really, really focused on uh, a real ethnographic understanding of our customers in America to say, what are the problems that they're facing from uh, a day-to-day -day perspective and how do we build products that actually solve for those needs in ways that uh, the larger banks are just not set up right now to actually go fix. Uh, Self Lender is helping people build credit and save money. Uh, the way it works is we've partnered with a couple of banks and basically make you a small loan that gets locked away in a bank account. So we, we lend you money, but we force you to save it. And so, you know, why would somebody want to do this? Well, they want to do it because they need to build their credit score, they need to save money. Um, and so the customer experience is really simple. Uh, you know, you join Self Lender, you make your monthly payments. Uh, if you pay on time, you know, you should, your credit score should go up. Um, and then at the end of the term, you've got this money saved up. So it's really, it's a savings plan that builds credit. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about millennials and take a little deeper look at the financial picture. I myself am a millennial, but if you look at the media, a lot of the portrayals are millennials are buying tickets to the fire Festival, spending all their money on avocado toast at brunch. <laughs> but there's some surprising statistics that show there's really more layers to that. So Charlie, there was one study that came out from Bankrate that said that only one in three millennials has a credit card. Could you talk a little bit more about what's kind of driving the move away from credit cards to other payment methods? Yeah, so we've been, uh, I've been at Sezzle here for three years, so I've been learning a lot about millennials and credit and access to credit. Uh, we saw the stat that young people were paying with debit in higher volumes than ever before, and we we're kind of wondering what was going on there. There's some talk that it was a preference, some talk that it was a lack of access, and I think that we've basically come to the conclusion that it's, that it's definitely a lack of access, and when we look at that, um, 
my view, that the major driver is that we have the global financial crisis back in 2008, and there are still repercussions from that. So credit tightened at that time. And then the next year, the government stepped in, and I think this is gonna be a surprising stat for, for learning for a lot of people. It was, it was made illegal to get a credit card at 18. So the legal age changed from 18 to 21, unless you had some sort of proof of a full-time job or your parents co-signed. So that was a massive change. And, and then credit card companies can no longer market on college campuses, which was another big change. And so you had a lot of young people adopting credit cards at later stages of life. And everyone here probably knows if you don't have a credit card, you can't build your credit or it's really difficult unless you got something like Self-Lender. So credit scores were coming down at the same time that credit tightening was happening and it created this really big void in the credit space. And you know, some of the laws in our view were done for the right reasons because a lot of young consumers were getting to thousands of dollars of debt. They were ruining their credit scores through bankruptcies and whatnot. And so not all of these were bad ideas, but the problem in the end led to a lack of credit access for young consumers. And that in turn also hurt the retailers that sold into young consumers because credit is really a tool for retailers to help them drive additional sales. And so that's where we really stepped in as a company to try to help with that. And so to that point, James, the, the average credit score for someone who's 21 to 34 is 638, which puts them below the prime level. Could you talk a little bit more about why credit is so important and you know, what young people need to do in order to build their credit? Yeah, so you know, your, your credit score unlocks so many things in life. I mean, obviously you're thinking, okay, well, credit cards, auto loans, mortgages, of course. But in many states, it's actually legal to use your credit score for insurance. Uh, you also have you know, utilities and cell phones, and th there's just the list goes on and on and on. And then you top that with, you know, some employers can actually say, you know what, we don't want you working here because we don't like what's on your credit report. Uh, so, you know, it, it's just important for people to build credit because it makes things cheaper and it, it offers better products that are more affordable. Um, and so in terms of how to build credit, you know, the, the simplest way is if you have a parent, you have a spouse, you know, who's, you really trust, you, know, you can be an authorized user on their card. That is the cheapest, simplest way to get started. Uh, however, if they don't pay their bill, then you're gonna get their credit history as well. Uh, so that's a, that's a potentially a challenge. Second thing is like, okay, go apply for a credit card. And if you get accepted, great, you're, you're getting started. You know, just use it responsibly. Um, but if you get rejected, and you know, what do you do next? Well, that's where something like self-lender or a secure credit card would come into play. Um, and uh, after that, it's, uh, I'm not really sure, so. And so Jay, it seems like a lot of this is driven by an aversion to debt. And there was actually a, a study that came out that said that millennials fear debt more than they fear climate change, war, public speaking, or death. So could you just talk a little bit about why you see, why there is such aversion to debt and kind of what the issue is? Yeah, I think um, it, it's an interesting question because there's so much about money and so much about, I think, what all of our companies collectively do that is around the psychology of money and how people think about it. And I think people saw a lot of things that happened during the financial crisis, right? People were burdened by uh, some pretty awful things that their parents went through. Uh, and I think they, you know, the fire festival ticket jokes aside, right? Like people do more than ever want to have a sense of control, wanting to make sure that they're really living, uh, you know, within their means, have a really good sense of how much money do I have at any one point? And yes, it may be challenging sometimes to make those ends meet, but I don't want to extend myself right now in a way that might come back to, to sort of bite me. Um, and I think like, being in control is a really, really big theme that we hear and the tools that we can actually give our customers to really help them be in control of their finances are the ones that end up being incredibly valuable, whether that's saying, hey, let's pre-allocate a, a portion of your uh, direct deposits that come in to a savings account or getting a periodic notification every single time you make a purchase to say, hey, by the way, here's what your balance now is. It's not just important to tell you what that purchase was, but what do you have left? Just to make sure that you are in control of that information that'll actually help you live your life. People, I think, fear credit cards. They fear credit because it's sort of this empty space where they don't really know. Um, and so the more we can actually do to cater to that new way of thinking, more companies like us will be, I think, successful in meeting their needs. If I could just echo, I think fear is such a powerful motivator, right? And I think we sometimes forget the impact of the Great Recession on this generation. Um, I, you know, my grandmother grew up in the Great uh, Depression. And when 
I remember till the day she died, she would make sure, did you eat everything on your plate? If there was a penny on the ground, pick it up, right? Because she knew a time when you had to wait in line to get bread. And so the, the millennials, as they were growing up, they saw their parents, loved ones, they read the news about people losing their home and, and, and not being uh, smartly invested or invested or saved. And, and it, I think it has had a profound impact on this generation that they are, that's why they're fearful of debt and they want to get a hold of their financial future. So I think fear is a powerful motivator and is a reason why companies like us are, are in this space. That, that reminds me of my grandfather. He actually used to steal all the jelly and peanut yeah. butter from restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they ever bought yeah. peanut butter. It was always just another the counter. <laughs> yeah. so, and then, Babak, on the topic yeah. of fear, uh, there was also a poll that said 66% of millennials are intimidated yeah. by investing. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about what that fear is and how to overcome that fear? Sure, and what we've seen is the number one reason people don't save is because they say they don't have enough money to save. We address that through the spare change, taking the spare change on transactions. So the old change jar that you had in there, everyone can contribute 10 cents or 20 cents. Um, and really uh, why people aren't investing is number one, they say they don't know how to do it, they don't understand it, and I think it's fear as well. Um, and so how we do that is, we, you know, at Acorns, our, our product really philosophy is making big decisions small. And so how do we like break down that barrier for the customer so they don't have to think about it, just kind of set it and forget it, right? It's really easy to do. That's number one. And then education. So we have our own content site called Grow. And it's really about through education, you know, giving them the tools that they need and the, and the information they need in a very easy, simple, distilled manner so that they could feel empowered about what they're doing. And we just uh, announced our Series E that was led through Comcast Ventures and CNB, uh, CNBC. So we have a joint content partnership uh, on a website called in, uh, Invest in You, Ready, Set, Grow, co-branded CNBC and Acorns, where we have content videos and articles about that serving millennials on how, the importance of their getting hold of their financial future. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned content education. Grow is a great resource. Chime also has a great blog on personal finance. Um, could you guys just talk a little bit more about kind of the need for that? It, it strikes me as something that is not really taught in schools, but is a huge topic that's so important. Yeah, I'll, I'll build upon um, what Bobak said, but also maybe take a slightly contrarian viewpoint, uh, which is uh, something actually that I, that I was reminded of uh, from a, a talk earlier today uh, at South by Southwest for, for a Common Sense Lab, where they basically said like 0.1% of change in behaviors driven by any sort of like financial education that you might be able to give or read. And I think that's the thing. It's like we might learn in a classroom, here's what you should do, here's what you shouldn't do. And I think lots of people intuitively know, like, I need to save more money. The reality of what people actually do is very different. And so I think there's two things that we really try to hold really dear to our philosophy is a little bit of what I talked about before. You have to build financial education, financial wellness into the product itself. You gotta make it dead simple. That's, that's obviously something that Acorns does as well. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't build really those things into the hooks of the product, then it's, you're never gonna win if you're gonna force someone who's super busy and maybe you know, not super focused on it to wanna watch a video about how to invest more efficiently. But doing it in a way that lowers those barriers is really effective. The other thing I'll say that we've, we've done that's really successful uh, is invest a lot in Instagram content. Um, and it sounds silly, but we actually have one of the biggest, probably I think the, the biggest Instagram following uh, of almost any fintech, uh, more I think than Acorns or SoFi who have been around for a little bit longer. And I think what that speaks to is we actually deliver a lot of content in really like small little bite-sized ways through stories, through other content in ways that are really engaging. Um, and, and that's one way we really try to say like here, we're, we're present for you in the midst of all the other things that you're actually doing and meeting you where you are rather than taking the poll model of saying, hey, we hope you at some point visit our blog or we hope you bookmark it, we hope you actually come there. And so that's been a really interesting strategy for us in terms of delivering financial wellness education. Bob, I think Jay just threw down the challenge for Instagram <laughs> followers. I we'll have to have a bet and re regroup next year. Yeah, I got to pull it. I'm not even on Instagram, but uh, no, um, I mean, that, it's smart. Exactly what he said. You have to in, in, incorporate in the product. I mean, grow is, is embedded, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and so I, I think it, it just at the end of the day, 66% of Americans can't pass a basic financial literacy test, right? That's scary. It's not taught at schools anymore. So my point was more of like education just needs to be part of how you, how you start to change their behavior. Uh, it also seems that trust is a big piece of this. Trust is key for millennials, for brands, but also there was a study that came out that said that of the 10 most distrusted brands, six of them were traditional banks for millennials. So could any of you speak to why traditional financial services maybe have lost that trust and what new fintechs or brands can do to get some of it back? Well, I, I can uh, bring a couple points here. So when we started our business, we actually used to pull in bank statement data 
to underwrite consumers. And Jay, your comment about the bank fees strikes home for me. I saw customers that had $2,000 in bank fees in six months, and it shocked me. And I thought, the banks are getting away with highway robbery here, and no one's calling them out on it. And 35 that, billion. What's that? 35 billion. 35 billion off people who make $50,000 or less. That's yeah, what I, banks are making. I, could, I couldn't believe I was shocked. And I told someone in our, our company about it recently, and he said he worked at a credit union, and he saw someone that had $10,000 and fees in a year. So, I mean, it's, it's egregious. And so I think that's how you lose trust, number one, uh, if you treat customers like that. Uh, but, but secondly, I think, you know, trust is, it's kind of a funny one for me because when I was in business school, I had this professor that would just pound home trust, trust, trust. It's the most important thing in business. And I used to kind of laugh at it, but now that I've been in business for a while, I totally agree that trust is number one. And so when we're working with our retail partners and talking about offering our product for, to their consumers, you know, I, I think for us, we talk about with them as trust, trust and repayment for the products that they're getting today. And even though it's, that's really too sezzle, there is some attribution to the brand that is a, a, a offering this in, in, in um, companion with us to their consumers. And that rolls over to the brand in terms of trust because they're trusting they're gonna be repaying. Yeah, and that, that's a segue. So I do want to talk about, for the brands, kind of why should retailers, why should brands care about financial wellness? What can they be doing to connect with their customer? Maybe to start, Bob, if you could tell, sure. talk a little bit more about the found money program. Sure. I'll, I'll just say trust, I think, is absolutely fundamental. I mean, that is the core, like doing right by your customer, doing what you say you're going to do, being transparent. I mean, those are the ways that you, like, switch yeah, traditional banks aren't doing that right and now they're panicking because we have a company like chime or an acorns but um so I, I told you about acorns we have a product <clears throat> that has really been my focus for the last two and a half years around what we saw is because when you sign up for an acorns account you can link as many debit or credit cards to your acorns account and we saw a bunch of transactions and we don't sell data we're, we're very privacy centric we you know we we make money based on the one dollar two dollar three dollars there's no penalty to the customer for taking money out, um, but we saw an opportunity really for brand partnerships um, because people are spending money and we thought, man, wouldn't it be really interesting if we could flip the paradigm from cash back or couponing where a brand can actually make an investment in their customer's financial future and knowing that millennials by and large and uh, our, our app skews a little bit younger, about 65% between 18 to 34, even though our goal is to get 100 million Americans saving and investing. Um, what, what we found is that, you know, this generation, they're very savvy. They're not, you know, the, the, whatever the stereotypes are, but they're the most savvy consumer and they really care about brands to do right by them and right by society. So there was a really interesting position, particularly as, as retail brands are struggling to connect with this generation and do it in a context that's relevant to them. Um, so basically what Found Money does is when a customer shops with a retailer and they're a, they're a partner with us, um, or take advantage of a, of a, of a product, will, that brand will actually make a cash forward investment into the customer's uh, Acorns account. Um, we started with four brand partners, we're over 300 brand partners, some affiliate based where you click through to shop, um, some card linked offers so the customer just uses the card that they have. Um, and we've seen incredible results. I mean, every time you go to Sam's Club, if you, you spend $50 to put a dollar in your account, if you book an Uber, you'll get 50 cents every time you book an Uber through the app. And we just signed a partnership with Chevron where every time you, you fill up or put $15 more, they'll put a quarter into your account. And what we found is we send a, congr you know, congratulations, Chevron's invested 25 cents. And that over time really helps change the perception of the brands, but what we found, it's also making a difference for our customers. So if you look at, you know, someone who con who's contributing $100 a month, and then you add on, oh yeah, a brand invested, you know, you earn $10 just based on shopping, just like you were going to do, right? You can really grow your, your financial future. And we're not, we're not um, promoting spending, we're just promoting smarter spending. So all things being equal, if, you shop, if you're gonna shop, shop with this brand, and you'll get the cash forward investment. And what was the biggest selling point for the brands themselves? What did they latch on to? Yeah, I mean, the main thing was engagement with this generation in the context of financial wellness, right? Be a, a kind of a competitive advantage um, play. Also, you know, just less and less millennials are coming through their doors or, or choosing their brands because they're savvier. And, and really what one of the tipping points was the Omnicom Group, um, the largest holding company led through the Hearts and Science Division, released a study that 65% of this generation, X and Y, are no longer being reached through traditional uh, media channels. 
And so really, you know, we're, we're this kind of innovative alternative to engage with this generation and do it and do right by them so they can do a lot of PR behind it, they can get behind it. Obviously, we have to achieve their business objectives, but we want to make sure we're balancing that with, with the right thing for our customer, which is, at the end of the day, what, we, what we're here to do at Acorns. Yep. And speaking of engagement, James, it strikes me as your project is, you know, requires engagement throughout the process, but where the consumer starts and where the consumer ends is completely different. So as an example of kind of what happens when you get this right, could you talk about the responses you see from consumers when you've increased their credit score by, say, 50 points? Yeah, so we, you know, we, we track their credit score every month. So when, when they sign for self-lender, they're getting their score. Every month they're, they're using it, they're getting their, their credit score. We're able to track this and give them some, you know, some feedback. And what we've seen is, you know, like, like any product, if you are new to credit and, you know, you've never had credit before and you get credit and you're responsible to use it, you're going to have a pretty massive impact. You're going to go from zero to, you know, 670 pretty consistently. Uh, or if you already have a score, you know, you'll see a, a decent improvement. Um, we've seen about 45 points. And you know, what we've done is we've automated notifications. So it's like, you know, you can set up and forget it or you can make, make these one-time payments. But the, the key has always been, you know, giving the customer transparency so they can see what's going on and giving them the ability to automate it and make it, make it so they can set it up and walk away. And then how about for uh, employers, for people that have their own company or have their own employees, are there things that they can be doing or paying attention to? Any, Jay, any thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've seen is um, some employers kind of in the, in the same well, vein of financial wellness and well-being start to approach us to say, how can we... Uh, they, they've often asked us, like, how can we deliver financial education for our, um, our employee employee base? Uh, and we often say that, that exactly what I said before, which is that it may not be that useful, but uh, maybe actually giving them a Chime account could be a, a start. Uh, and so we're starting to see uh, a few employers actually uh, take steps to do that. Uh, we see that their employees uh, spend less time worrying about their finances at work, feel more uh, well-adjusted financially, and are doing really... Uh, better financially than they were before. And so that's kind of an interesting trend that we're seeing. Uh, em em employers really starting to take charge uh, around trying to solve this problem for their employees uh, and, and provide them better solutions than what they're seeing uh, out there in the market before. And so then in, in closing, and then I'd open it up to see if anyone has any questions, but uh, I'd love to end with just a forward-looking view a little bit. And if we could go around and you could all share either something you expect to see, a trend that you're watching, or a prediction, or something that you would like to see in the area of financial wellness for the next, say, three years? Well, I think there's already a focus on credit scores for young consumers out there. I mean, you can see all the rise in like Credit Karma and similar apps for watching your credit scores. I mean, every bank is offering it now. But I think it's gonna become a, a big focus because this generation had a huge drop in their average credit scores, and they're gonna start to realize the impact of that as they start to try to buy a house or buy a car. Uh, and so I think the, the, the education on that front will be important, but also the, like the effort to build credit scores up is gonna be a big one. Yeah, I mean, I, at Acorns, we're, we're building a financial wellness system. So it, you know, I, I told you kind of the steps that it starts, but it's not stopping there, right? Offering 529s, um, uh, offering you know, ways for people to reduce debt, um, to refinance student loans, like oh, all those elements to really just kind of be that partner um, for the consumer for all their financial needs is, is really, I think, where we're going in, in a What is a 529? Point. I actually don't know, so I'm guessing others <laughs> do. When, when, you have, when you have kids, that you, you can set aside money for their college. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, yeah, you, there go. you go, yeah. <laughs> um, I think the other thing that we're starting to see, or, or just sort of a trend, I think, very often people like to look at markets like uh, you know Lyft and Uber and there's going to be a winner and or there's like DoorDash and Uber and Grab like who's going to win? I think one thing to often see is that these markets are really really big uh, and it's really interesting to see all the different uh, pain points that people are starting with and, and sort of like we're all going to probably converge somewhere at the end but in the end like the market's really big. You think about how much money people are being charged in fees or how many bank accounts Chase has and Citi has and, and Bank of America has. Uh, and how many people that they're underserving. And it's a really, really, truly massive market. So it'll be really interesting to see how people really think about the different types of customer journeys that actually result from all these different types of products, whether you start from the checking account, whether you start from the savings account, whether you start from investing, uh, lending, uh, what have you. Yeah, I, I think you guys are going to be a lot happier. I, I, think, I think you and all consumers are going to be a lot happier with our financial products because there's a lot more... Uh, opportunity.
um, the, the thing about what you know, we're doing, everybody here as well as a, a lot of other companies, you know, we're creating a world where you've got this transparency, you understand you know, exactly what's going on. You know, today you walk into a bank and you have no idea, like, like you know, there's no menu, there's no, no, you don't have that transparency that you have when, when you have something that is super simple and app-based and, and online. So I think we're just gonna have a lot more happier consumers in the future. Great, thank you. Well, at that point, I'd like to see, if anyone have any burning questions? Yeah, I think we can get Mike coming over, yeah. Hi, um, I own a weighted blanket company, and we just have so many ways to pay to check out. We have like, you know, we just added Afterpay, we have Apple Pay, we have, so if, if you guys could help me kind of pick my poison there, you know, I don't want 30 options to pay when they check out, but they all try to convince me to use them because, so many people are going to use them. So I don't know if this is really your area of expertise, but if you had any input for me, it'd be helpful. Yeah, I, unless you want to answer it, Chris. I was looking you know, one of the uh, things that we've researched is basically, or we've seen research around, is the number of payment methods you add actually increases conversion. Because there are some customers that prefer to use Amazon, or they prefer to use PayPal. And so when you, when you add those payment methods that the customer prefers to use, of course, it's going to increase conversion because they've already got an account set up. And for you, you've spent all that money attracting them to your website. And really, it's just about getting them through the checkout as fast as possible. So in the data that we've seen, the more the better, even though it starts to seem kind of crazy. Yeah, it seems kind of crazy, but it does work. Yeah, I'll, I'll also kind of echo that as someone who worked at Venmo who was trying to build a similar product. Uh, if you haven't adopted Venmo, I'll, I'll come find you later and <laughs> I can still sell you on an old product. But um, but, but yeah, we, we basically talked the same, so I had the same research that we, we share with merchants, which is that um, having PayPal, having Venmo, having Apple Pay, having Visa Checkout in some cases um, was attracting some incremental customers. And so there are probably some things that have a slightly diminishing marginal utility, but I think the important question to ask anyone as you're really thinking about that incremental payment method is like, what is this incremental customer base that this is tapping into? And is, is it something that is special either through uh, a unique sort of lending product at checkout or is it a cost customer base? Is it something that's social? Um, is it something that has like the breadth of a network that a PayPal or Amazon does have? So. Yeah, um, so you guys are talking about like education being kind of one of the main challenges. Just curious, like why do you think it's not required in high school or college anymore? And is it on the small private institutions to exit, you know, educate people? Uh, just curious if you think that the big banks and the government essentially want you to be in debt, uh, especially with the college debt problem. Because I, I do some like entrepreneurship high school classes and it just blows my mind how many history classes there are, geometry, when you can get a college degree without taking one financial literacy class. So just curious on, you know, your guys' opinions on that. My, my skeptical viewpoint on it is like no child left behind and like teaching to tests. And like, so you just don't have the time and space for other areas of life literacy. So I think that's fallen a bit by the wayside. Uh, because there are these discrete things that you need to do to progress. And so maybe the answer is having something that's more formalized around there, but yeah. I mean, my take, I mean, we probably have a panel on, on education, right, and how it needs to progress and innovate and why it hasn't, right, and is it actually setting up this generation to be successful in the workforce? I mean, that's an entire, like, you know, uh, probably a semester, <laughs> right? But why, I don't know why they're not teaching it, right? It, it's critical, and I think it's up to, we can't just leave it to our schools, right? I think it's up to parents, and one of the reasons I was so excited at Acorns is when I had my daughters, and I thought, man, when I was 18 and coming out of school, I didn't have enough money to invest and, and say, I didn't, I was in debt, right? And so, but if I had something that I could start for as little as $5, and, and the, you know, the, the ultimate factor in investing is time, so the earlier you start, the better it is for you, for you long term. That's really what motivated me. And so what I want to do is I want to make sure my daughters know about the importance of saving and investing. And there's a product like a Chime or an Acorns that I could say, hey, you know, look at this, do this kind of thing. Um, so the, the, that's one of the key things. And, and we as a company, you said, why do the big banks do it? I, I don't think they care. Um, 
Um, so, I mean, we're a mission-based company. Our mission is to look after the financial best interests of the up and coming. Uh, and that is, that's made every partnership, every business decision, every product we launch focuses around that mission. And I just think that they don't necessarily care about the customer. They just look at the customer as a way to make money. And so with all the, the companies up here, we're looking at it differently. Um, and so, you know, as he mentioned, it's a, it's a great time to be a consumer in the financial space. I think your, your point is a great one. And I really don't know the answer either of why it's not taught because it is so critical as a life skill going forward. And I think it actually exacerbates the this difference between rich and poor because rich families are teaching their children you know, how to manage money, getting them a credit card, co-signing with them when they're 18 so they can build their credit. And some, company, some of these families that aren't as well advantaged don't have that access or that education and they're not doing those things, which makes it even harder, which is why it's really kind of sad that those types of items aren't taught in high school. So I'd, I'd love to see the change. What's incredible, every, we, we do an all-hands meeting every Tuesday, and our CEO will read letters that our customers write, write to him. It, it's, I mean, it'll bring you to tears, some of the stories. I mean, people on welfare getting divorced, you know, his family member passed away, and how they see hope in acorns. And I mean, that motivates me in, you know, enough to like, keep working, is that people just want a, someone, you know, hope, and then help me get there, right? Give me some kind of plan. I'm so, you know, I'm excited for the future. I think we probably have time for one more question, if there is one. If not, we can, yep. yep. Uh, I was just curious on the Sezzle side, if you guys see a specific vertical or a specific price point that your installment approach has the, the biggest impact as far as cart conversion goes. And if not, it's just across the board, maybe what's the craziest thing you've seen bought on installment? So our price point is actually a pretty surprisingly low. It's $80. Which, so it's, it's basically being used for everyday purchases. Uh, you know, I think we typically are like in beauty, health, cosmetics, fashion, uh, but we're in electronics as well. I mean, it's pretty widespread. You know, our, the, in my view, the hidden competitor to our product is really PayPal because people are using it. It's like a PayPal with a purchasing punch for the consumer. And so they get into it because it has, gives them that initial purchasing power, but it's got the same simplicity, ease of use, and they keep on using it every day. Uh, and craziest thing that we've bought. I mean, there's been, we have, I, <laughs> we'll have to talk after this, I think, because, because some of the, the companies that have signed up for us, you're like, really, they, people sell this? It, it, we have some up. companies we have to say no to. We can't work <laughs> <Yeah>. with. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for, for being here. Thank you, all panelists, for all your insights. We'll be uh, hanging out afterwards if you have any more questions, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.